So hi everyone, my name is Seema Alexander and I'm coming to you live on day three. At this point, our 65th panel of the week. I can't even believe it. <laughs> I'm the founder and chief strategy officer of disruptive.ceo, the strategic advisory firm focused on supporting visionary founders and companies to scale and grow. And I've also had the privilege of curating the growth track for the DC Startup Week community this year. If you're not familiar with DC Startup Week, it is a five day completely free resource for budding entrepreneurs and growth stage entrepreneurs in the Washington DC uh, metro area every September. For something like this, putting it together, obviously we need sponsors and partners and we are honored to have our title sponsors be next, powered by Shulman and Rogers, Insperity, Wiz, and Technology Rivers. So in this session, I'm really excited about it because I was able to curate a group of people that I think are going to give you a different perspective on growing in the government sector. Um, as you probably have noticed, we don't have a lot of panels on, on government within the uh, DC startup community this, this year, and partly because there's a lot of resources out there. We are in the hub of, of government contracting land. However, with this particular topic, how to grow your company through government agency partnerships and contracts, um, you know, with the people that you are about to meet, you're going to get perspective from folks who are helping the government analyze startups and innovation. You're going to get other folks who are helping startups with go to market uh, strategies to get into the agency. Then you have founders that have grown and scale substantially over a 10 year period. Others that are focused on building innovation and commercializing and getting into defense agency and how they did that. Um, and lastly, we have a gentleman who is a partner uh, at a portfolio company and an EVP at a large scale government contracting firm within the portfolio all, and also has exited out of a government agency. So with, with that, I'm going to introduce Rhea Patel. She is our moderator from Decode. And Decode, they basically connect the tech industry and the government to dr drive commercial innovation in the federal market. She's an ER moderator. We have Pramod Raheja on the panel. He's the CEO and co-founder of Airgility. He was previously our moderator this week and kicked off our uh, number one, our first panel on Monday. Really excited to have him back. We have Joy Sanneberger, who is uh, from CEO of Boone Group. Naveen Krishnamurthy, he's the CEO of Reva Solutions. And Larry Lateau, the operating partner of Enterprise Partners, the portfolio company, and EVP of Meridian. So one last logistics before I hand it over to Ria. If you have any questions during this talk, please put them in all caps in the, in the chat box below. We will go through them as she deems appropriate throughout the conversation, try to answer them as we go. So please join me in welcoming Ria Patel to the DC, DC Startup Week stage. Ria? Thank you, Seema, and really, really, really looking forward to this panel. I think this is such a really fantastic and dynamic group of uh, leaders who have a ton of experience working with federal um, and all of the sort of nitty gritty that goes along with trying to be successful in the federal market. So um, really quick, uh, we're going to try and have as much of a conversation as possible because there are so many people who have such a wealth of experience and knowledge um, on this panel. And I really want to make sure that we capture everyone's experiences and guidance for all of you. Uh, but definitely, as Seema mentioned, drop your questions in the chat throughout the, throughout the panel. And we will make sure to reserve quite a bit of time uh, nearing the end to answer all of those questions. Um, so right before we kick in, and I have a whole host of questions um, for this group, but would love to just um, have each of you guys just give a little quick recap of your background and your experience in the federal market. And I know some of you, um, we went over a very, very high level of what your company does, but definitely please feel to intro your um, company as well. So I will start with the order of Pepto-Bismol on my screen. So Larry, would you mind kicking us, kicking us off? Yeah, my name is Larry Lee Tao. I'm currently the operating partner at Enterprise. My background, we've uh, done three exits and uh, with basically a couple of services companies and one product company. And now we are, you know, now I help evaluate companies. We, we acquire them and then we help grow them. And of course, we'd like to exit them as well. Thank you, Larry. Naveen? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, Naveen Krishnamurthy, CEO, founder of Reva Solutions, local product, um, you know, in and out of Silicon Valley, product side, then switched to services 
and then government exited one company currently in GovCon on my second one uh, just hit our 10 year anniversary and uh, close to 500 employees now and I apologize for my voice in advance Thank you, Naveen. And um, I just assume that's like the gritty, like that's just part of who you are. So don't apologize. <laughs> Promote. Hey, good, uh, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Promote or Mode for short. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Air Agility. We are also a local startup, uh, uh, proud Terp, and uh, we work on my company, Air Agility. We do artificial intelligence and autonomous systems for essentially robots. We put the intelligence and robots, both air, ground, and in the in the uh, in the water as well. And uh, longtime serial entrepreneur in the DC area. And this company is the first one where I'm actually doing B to G work. And so it's been a new thing for us over the last three years. So I'm excited to share some of that uh, learning with our early stage founders on this call. Thank you, Pramod. And last but certainly not least, Joy. Hey, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Joy Schanenberger. I am the founder and CEO of a company called Boone, who, fun fact, I named after my great grandmother who helped oh. raise me. Um, she won the first ever Business Man of the Year Award as a female entrepreneur in Detroit when she turned her restaurant into a munitions production line. So Boone is very much inspired by the arsenal of democracy and um, those efforts that led to help win World War II. Uh, our singular purpose is to build a machine for the rapid acceleration of critical technologies for national security and DOD. Um, by way of background, I was once upon a time an advertising agency executive where I learned I didn't care about uh, Windex and selling consumer goods and then got recruited into Homeland Security um, as a private investigator and then found my way to Washington. Thank you, Joy. And to kick it off, and I know um, Naveen and Joy, we had this conversation um, a couple of weeks ago, but uh, we talked a little bit about some of the biggest knowledge gaps that founders have, especially founders who are new to, to the federal market. And so we'd love to ask all of you, um, and I have a feeling I know what, what some of you are going to say, but what would you say are our founders' biggest knowledge gaps when it comes to understanding the federal market, especially those who are new to working in federal? Uh, I can start off. I mean, one, one of the biggest things I think is in the government, federal government is really understanding acquisition. You know, in, in commercial, it's, hey, I've, I've got a customer with budget and a requirement, and I've got, hey, I've got what you need, you break, broker that deal. But in the government, tied to checks and balances and taxpayer dollars, really understanding how, how that, how you can navigate that. It's a little bit complex you know, and everybody does it a little different and it takes a little bit of a learning curve, but a critical piece uh, in order to get your foothold in the government. And the only thing, I think that's a great, great answer. Also, I, we follow the money. You gotta know where the dollars are, you know, where the pro, you know, each program might be funded, which, which programs are funded, which agencies have the money, you know, depending on who's in office might dictate where the money's going. So you just, you really gotta understand that. Yeah, I I'll add to Go ahead. Go, go ahead, ahead, Joy. No, you go. <laughs> no, you. Um, no, I think I think to add to that, um, there is, it doesn't have to be as complex as people say. Everybody says it's really, really difficult, um, which is true. I think what, when we've worked with other founders who are scaling tech companies into national security market in particular, the knowledge gap exists around, um, well, why can't you just create a budget? Like, go find the money. <laughs> like, well, that's not quite how it works. And so um, we found success in using metaphors to explain, here's how your commercial sales are going to work. And if you have a dual purpose technology, you can ride your commercial wave while you lay the strategic part down for natural security and mission-based sale. Um, and that that's worked, worked really well. But yeah, I think sometimes people just, it's like it does not compute function, right? Well, what do you mean? Just ask them for the money. I don't get it. Um, and then the time frame, which, you know, Ryan, I know you know a lot about that. And I'll add just from a, as a long time B2B guy, just getting into B2G or B2G government uh, was a whole, it's a whole different learning curve. And, and to everybody's point here, um, that's all true. Everything that everybody said, what I'll add, however, is that as you, there's probably a lot of early stage founders on this call. And as you're trying to figure out that initial navigation, you should also really know who you are and what you're trying to go after. You know, it's just a, such a big ocean 
Um, and you could be chasing so many different things and nothing could happen. So really figure out who you are and what your goals are. And that'll help also dictate exactly what avenues you go down and start following as well. And on that promote and join, I mentioned quickly dual use tech as well. And I think this is a really interesting thread to pull. Um, have you found that there are good indicators for when early stage startups or founders should actually think about entering the federal market or I think at Deco, we've seen quite a number of times companies enter federal and then they flounder and then sort of run out of their resources and runway really fast. Um, and it's not a pivot worth taking. But then for some companies, there's a right time and um, place in their growth and their growth strategy to enter the market. And so I was curious if you all have seen those indi indicators. And Pramod, I will ask you um, particularly about why B2G for your agility and, and why you thought that was a gr good growth strategy for where, um, how you wanted to build the company. Yeah, sure. So Joy brought up a really good point around dual use. Um, so I'd say back in the day, when I say back in the day, I'm talking a lot of years ago, and Larry probably has been around the block a bunch of times here. There were a lot of Beltway Bandits and all they did was just, you know, do government contracting or in our world, since I, I my company does a lot of R&D and innovation, we see companies that just jump from uh, uh, these, they call them small business innovation research or SBIRs. They just jump and get a bunch of those and they jump to the next one. And we, we strategically said, that's not who we are. However, we will utilize these SIBRs or SBIRs to help us really create our technology and to get it to the next level. Um, you know, the, the, to get it to a higher technology readiness level where now it can be something we sell to the government and can be used in the commercial sector. So to answer your question directly about why we chose the government, we are doing DOD, what we are doing very innovation, innovative technology that we feel is very relevant to DOD and other government entities. And, you know, from, a, from an impact perspective or, or a mission perspective or a why we do what we do, we also feel strongly about defending the homeland. And so we, we are, you know, we want to be involved with uh, defense projects and DHS projects that help us really, that help the country as a whole. And so we have a, you know, we have a strong sort of uh, why I'll say, and that's why we really went down that path. And, and the other thing is, as Larry to point to Larry's point, we followed the money as well, because there's a lot of DOD innovation money out there if you know where to look. And, and so we did, we did go down that path. Yeah, we, 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 you know, we used to laugh, but the government's fortune one, right? We, we, you know, that's it. They're the number one customer in the, in the country. So that, that's why we decided early on. And, you know, you, you call them Beltway Bandits. We used to just soften the name and call us <laughs> Highway Helpers. But, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, for us, it was, it was, you know, it's a lot more different now. I mean, the contracting, the acquisition process, but it's still who you know. So you do have to develop relationships and, you know, get in front of the, the, the small business, the SBIR teams, all these teams. You can't just expect to wake up and say, I'm going to go sell the government and then figure that they're going to give you a, a contract. It's just not going to happen that way. You know, we, we took a, a, you know, a little bit of a kind approach. Um, it, it, we kind of look at it like a crawl, walk and run strategy. You know, you kind of have to sub to prime. You kind of sometimes have to do work that you normally wouldn't do or to pay the bills and add an infrastructure. Uh, and then the government with their set-asides and NAICS codes and vehicles, you, you kind of have to navigate your growth and, and kind of keep pivoting your strategy as you hit, hit these corporate maturity models. And I think, I think the hardest one and statistically the hardest one is to get into that $2 million in revenue. And so if you're able to navigate through that and give yourself a timeline and a runway, and, and you know, you really got to, you know, to promote point, you got to really find your best path to get there because uh, trying to learn it for two years is usually why people end up floundering and, and exiting quickly. Yeah. And um, back to the original question, I think what I heard was, um, is there a right time? And if so, like, what does that look like, right? And um, the answer is there's, there's not really a perfect equation. It's very dependent upon your product or service and your goal, right? So I'm gonna caveat it there, but some of the themes that we see, and Larry, I'm sure you see this in your M&A portfolio, right? Um, 
is a minimum of a million dollars in recurring commercial revenue is really, really helpful. Like when, when, it, when I say recurring, I mean, it's there, it's a business line. You're not getting a new million every year. It's just, it's on your books. Um, and then in terms of the readiness of a uh, technology, we find more success in companies that have something other than just a prototype. So kind of a, a minimum viable product MVP and startup world, right? Um, where somebody can actually use it and tell you how they like it, how they tailor it. Um, and then the third thing, right back to, back to mod it is, um, understanding at what point to leverage sivers to have that feed your growth path. But just because you win a sibber or just because you win an InQtel work program one time does not mean that you have federal revenue that you can go raise money against and then make back, you know, your, the, your investment dollars, right? If, um, if you are a, a vested company. And then, you know, the last thing there is, is make sure that your financial model actually works. And a, a good rule is 33 and a third, right? You've got a third spend on SG&A, sales, general and admin, overhead, et cetera, a, a third on COGS, cost of goods sold or whatever your product is. And then that profitability and profitability, even in the federal government is not a bad thing. You have to be profitable in order to reinvest and recapitalize and grow and scale on a mission. So those are some of the things that we've seen on when is the right time. Um, I like the 2 million mark a lot better. It's a little bit safer, but bare minimum, a million in recurring in commercial markets. Excellent advice. And on that, so I, we just, we threw around a lot of acronyms and government jargon. And one of the ones that I think is most um, prevalent, especially for those early stage founders is SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research Program. So Naveed and Pramod, um, I know you you all have worked and had SBIRs before, or currently are on contract with SBIRs. Joy and Larry, I know you are very familiar with SBIRs and how they work and when and how to sort of incorporate it into a growth strategy. But I'd really love to ask you all about your, Naveen and Pramod, especially on your experiences of, um, of utilizing the SBIR program and then also how you sort of scale beyond just some of these like smaller, you know, SBIR one year period of performance type um, programs and pilots that are really meant to expose companies who are new to government into the market, but not really meant to be a sustainable recurring um, source of revenue for years to come. Um, yeah, sure. So, I mean, our experience um, was, you know, it's a former SPR with NOAA, uh, part of the Department of Commerce, and it's, you know, it, it was such a great opportunity for us to introduce a new product, uh, work with academia, work with some key stakeholders, but you know, really understanding how you're going to move from phase one to three, what, where, where, what are the goals in order to achieve that, the money you gain and the work to get there, and even to get the initial SPR is definitely not a simple path, um, but it is achievable. Um, for us, you know, second part of your question is that really helped us kind of as a launching pad to grow into, you know, what to get contracts and, you know, building that credibility um, we didn't really, I would say, use the SBIR program. I actually think we use that to really expand building the credibility and the relationships in order to win one, two, three, four, 12 contracts at NOAA, uh, and then reference back to the super cool product we bought that you know, the scientists were using, the GIS layer, with academia supporting, et cetera. So just build that credibility because instead of referencing just a product in the commercial world, we were able to do some, show something we did with peers that sat down the hallway and they could reference. Yeah, for, for, yeah for, and I'll go, oh, ahead. go ahead, Larry. No, go. Oh, I was just going to add, uh, Ria, to answer your question. Uh, so, you know, for us, again, just having early stage technology, which I'm sure there's probably a number of founders on this call that have early stage technology. It's, it's a really great way to accelerate that progress. And to Naveen's point, it's not that straightforward to get a cyber. There's a whole cottage industry around it, of course, too. So you can get help, of course, and you can call your friends and you can call these other companies and they'll come help you as consultants. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's a learning curve. And you have to, again, strategically decide that this makes sense for your company. For us, it absolutely made sense because it gave us early stage uh, validation and, uh, and a track record. So now as we 
as we go forth and kind of regret, you know, sort of graduate out of that, I'll call it, and, and where we're selling products and services, um, it, it really helped serve a purpose. Um, now, that being said, for us, strategically, we've decided that R&D remains a certain component of our company for a long time, a certain percentage. So we will still continue to do these things. We're just not going to, they're not going to be the sole focus. Uh, so that, I don't know if that helps uh, with, with what you asked. And go ahead, Larry, sorry about that. No, just, you know, for us, you know, you have, you have to have something of value, right? Whether it's, whether it's a technical expertise that, that is rare or your product is unique. You know, we, we, had a, we were building a cross-domain solution and DIA put out a special SBIR that gave uh, three companies a million dollars to develop a, a cross-domain. We, so we were sort of uh, had ours sort of developed. We were one of the three. We basically had four months. We actually had to build it on site, which is a very unique part of our solution. And then we we presented to them, and they picked one company to roll it out and uh, across the the world. We were lucky; we were we won that. And then, of course, we had to deal with other contracting issues because then we got shoved under under a big prime because they wanted to get it so quick that they felt that they didn't need to give us a contract. We wanted a prime, and it turned out we ended up being a sub and had to give up some of our profits. So you you never know which way it goes, but you know ultimately for us, we knew we had to bring value, something very unique. Um, and Larry, I actually would love for you to share a little bit more about your experience there, because I think that's also something that a lot of uh, early stage founders or folks who are new to federal um, aren't used to is navigating the prime contract contractors and understanding um, that prime sub relationship. So uh, Larry, first, I'd love for you just to expand upon that a little bit more and some of the lessons you learned out of that experience. But then um, Naveen Pramo, then Joy, I know you all have experience not working with the prime contractors and navigating them. And so would love for you all to share your experiences and, and tips you would provide for these founders if they're, they're looking to uh, negotiate or work with a prime. Yeah, for, for me, I learned really quick, nothing's for free. You know, you, you had to give up something. And so... Anytime you work with a prime, first of all, you know that whatever you negotiate, unless you, unless you bring some power, uh, whether the customer wants you really bad or something, you're going to live by their terms and they're not going to negotiate too much on their contracts. But you know, you got you got to uh, the idea is you got to get inside, and if you get in good with, uh, we happen to get in very close with Northrop Grumman very early in my career, and they took us everywhere, every every project that they did within DOD, we were on their team. So we grew rapidly under, under them. So sometimes it can be a great relationship, but ultimately you have to realize there's a give and get. Yeah, you know, I kind of echo that a little bit. Um, I'm gonna be honest, you know, subbing sucks. <laughs> yeah, primes are not easy to deal with. A lot of them are trying to find a way through directives to take away your work, um, reduce your rates, steal your employees. So can be very difficult. You gotta really look at your leverage um, in order to navigate a lot of that. Um, that said, you know, for three, four years, that's what we did. Helped us pay the bills. Uh, we managed managed a lot of the difficulties around it. But um, I would say a big, big portion of it is the relationship. Um, it isn't just the company or anything like. If, if you, it, it's, it's even sometimes a division or a group or an individual. And if you're able to show value and, you know, like Larry said, kind of keep following people, um, they'll keep bringing you along and, and, and build a good, solid relationship with you. And that's kind of your uh, defense mechanism as well to protect yourself. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Larry, you're absolutely right. Nothing is free. Um, the most frustrating thing to see is a small company having to go through a prime and the prime takes a 300% markup on that thing. Right. Um, and that, that just sucks. There's, there's no other way to describe it other than it. It just really stinks. Um, but you can pre-negotiate terms if you've got government buy-in. Um, one way to establish government buy-in is a program in the office of small business um, at DOD run by a gentleman named Shannon Jackson. He's a terrific individual. Um, and he runs the mentor protege program. I highly, highly, highly recommend for any small tech company or services company trying to make it in government contracting to spend the time to um, actually get into the mentor protege program. What that does is it gives you a dedicated relationship like Larry described um, 
with a prime, right? Larry, I think you said Northrop, right? Is who you guys, yeah. So it establishes a relationship. So Boone could be in the mentor protege program as a small company, establish a relationship with Northrop Grumman and the government actually holds the prime accountable to meeting certain standards to grow that small business because the government has a vested interest in seeing small businesses succeed. Um, so that's the second thing I would add. And then the third gotcha that people run into is define your IP in advance. Um, definitely, definitely take the time to understand what is yours and then what the prime has access to so they don't just develop something on their own and scale it and then you're, you're out of the market. And I'll just share. Thank you, Joy. That, I mean, that was some really good, good tips. I was taking notes there. And um, a couple, a couple of things I'll add since we are on the uh, younger stage side of maybe Naveen and Larry here. Uh, we, we are doing these things that, that, you know, where we're starting to talk to these primes. We just went through a program, uh, something called U.S. Air Force Labs, which was basically 10 startups selected out of a pool of 400. And as soon as we got into that, it gave us a lot of visibility. So we started to get contacted by primes and, and we're still, you know, in discussions with some of them. And uh, as Joy just pointed out, uh, yes, those discussions are right at the forefront, the IP and who, who gets what. And so, uh, you know, I don't have as much, much experience as Naveen and Larry in those, in those situations. However, uh, I think for people that are on the earlier side, I would also say find programs that are not obvious and, and, and it's not even obvious to find them. So we've gone through this US Air Force Labs, we've gone through a smart cities program with the DHS Science and Technology Directorate. There's these programs that are out there and they're popping up and I'd say, you know, just, you just gotta kind of pay attention and, and there's program, there's, there's organizations like the Center for Innovation and Technology in Virginia and, and a lot of these, organizations at the state level serve as conduits to the federal level. So that's how we've sort of got our foot in the door. And speaking of foot in the door, and I'm also noticing a theme in some of the, the early questions in the chat, but everyone seems to have the same sort of question around building that network and building that those relationships in the federal market. So in particular, our there are um, certain agencies or contractors currently engaging with early stage founders um, and how are they collaborating with each other? And I think at large, my, my question here is, which most of you have hit on is, how can some of these founders sort of get their foot in the door with the, with the community and with the ecosystem? I, I'm, oh, sorry, Larry, you got it. No, go. <laughs> okay, I feel like we need buttons, you know? No, you know. <laughs> um, one of the uh, best ways to join the community is to engage with an organization called the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum. Um, it's really large. It goes across the entire United States and there's basically sub innovation pockets. The Midwest is really active. Um, I'm biased because I'm from Detroit, so I like to see productivity there. Um, you know, we're in DC. There's, there's all sorts of things through that network. I think there's about um, I don't know, five, five to 7,000 folks in it now, and it's open. You can um, join the, uh, what's called DEF, D-E-F, the DEF Slack channel. Um, those are great opportunities to just say, hey, I'm new, I'm looking to connect with people, um, help me figure up from, up from down. It's a great first step. And then from there, you can start figuring out the pockets that are more valuable to you and your business, and then start engaging with government leadership directly. Um, you know, I think DECO does a fantastic job of, of connecting those people and giving those that space and forum to chat to. So um, their events are another great resource. It, it's very different now, right? I mean, we live in a different world. Uh, so networking has changed. You know, Cyber Command has, a, has its own incubator facility called Maryland Innovation and Security Institute in Columbia, Maryland. And they would hang out there and they would have days where you could showcase your product, you could get with other companies and work on maybe a, a product together there. Uh, it's, that's still open and still being used, but of course it's, it's a little bit different than it was. So you, you just have to find where every agency has a way of developing young capabilities, young businesses. So you have to find them and, and they're, they're there, but they're not uh, as promising. They're not obvious and you have to sort of look to where they're at. Um, for us, we, we went with the strategy of um, networking uh, strategically. So, you know, first off, I went and talked to 30 business owners uh, who'd already done it before, you know, over the course of a year. 
Um, I looked at specific markets I wanted to get into. What is the trade association? Is there committees I could join? Could I actually have a volunteer opportunity? Um, I think that there's a consistency of it all. I think it's very easy from a self-discipline path to get overwhelmed because there are so many organizations and hop around. Uh, but in order to build relationships, there has to be a consistency and a commitment when you, you know, when, in order to kind of drive value get. The other one is um, a simple thing that I think is personal. Do you have it in you to do one or two networking events, breakfast, lunch, dinners every week? I probably have done it for 20 years. Um, and I think it's almost like, it's, it's like br brushing my teeth. Like I've just done it so long. And, you know, meet one new company, go to one networking event. And I think it's so hard coded in me. It's helped me really build my network, have uh, some solid relationships and connections. Very true. And uh, plus one there for uh, for the um, for the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum. Uh, we're part of that. That's definitely a great network. And then uh, to uh, Naveen's point, we do the same thing. And there's a I'll give a book recommendation here for our listeners uh, or viewers which is ne Never Eat Alone. I did this on the last, on the other panel too. It's by a guy named Keith Ferrazzi. If you read the book, that's great. But even if you don't read the book, you can just read the title and know exactly what he means. So. <laughs> and on that, and I think, uh, I'll have to double check the dates, but I'm pretty sure the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum Deaf Conference is coming up in a couple of weeks. So if people are looking to check that out, it's a great opportunity to actually start to build those um, relationships within that community. But any, since this is DC Startup Week, any particular events, programming, um, communities that are DMV based, and Larry, you touched on it, um, but we'd love to hear those recommendations as well. Any of the other ones that are useful um, are associations, and you have to be careful because sometimes you give associations money and then you don't actually get value out of it. It's like integrating a new project management tool for your team and then nobody using it. <laughs> it's the same thing. So um, but some of the associations that we found useful um, are definitely NDIA, National um, Defense Industry Association, um, AIA, and then even some of um, what's called uh, a think tank or a federally funded research and development center. So RAND, MITRE, CNAS, um, things like that, they will produce certain types of content and events and bring certain types of government folks from the left and the right. Um, so there's there's obviously partisan organizations, nonpartisan organizations, and all that's really meaningful to get inside leadership's head and understand their pain points. Um, and usually they're attracting uh, the right folks into the room. So uh, if you do that, you're in good shape. I'll also add that for some of the earlier stage companies, there's a lot of newer accelerators for the government. So Decode obviously, has some things going on. Uh, there's one for the National Security Innovation Network, NSIN, which is right here in McLean. They have a program. And then there's FedTech also, where they have a number of programs for early stage founders to license technology, meet co-founders. Uh, and so there's a lot of resources, I, I think, that are starting to form on the networking and acceleration side. Um, my, my current favorites are PSC and ACT IAC. Um, if, but there is a, definitely a company fees. Um, I think we're part of CCAF too and a couple more, but starting out, you know, AFSIA is a good one. You know, there's individual memberships, so you can just sign up per event. Um, and I, I think the other, the other one that, um, I think people sleep sometimes is, you know, Larry talked about being small business, I think, but the Ostabu conference is a good one. That's held annually, a lot of great exposure, everybody all in one setting. Uh, well, we'll have to see how that goes next year. Just to, just to add, whether you join an association or join a group, it, you got to have consistency and you got to be involved. If you just go there and show up, you're probably not going to get much out of it, especially if you only go twice and say, wait, what the hell's going on? But you have to be there all the time. And, and if there's a committee or a position, you got to go attain that if you really want to get value. 100% agree. And I will, I also note that every, one of you mentioned it on the panel as well, but every single agency has their way in. Um, 
um, it has a, a program or office dedicated to helping you find the way in. So for instance, like Naval X, which is sort of the Navy's innovation um, program and big initiative right now has a happy hour every month or has open office hours every month. And there are, there are groups um, across both DOD and the civilian that have si something similar. And so if you are targeting a certain agency or know that you are looking to looking to get your foot in the door in a specific program or, or organization, try and find out what sort of gatherings they have on a consistent basis. Because almost every single agency has some sort of consistent um, programming or a happy hour or right now it's all virtual um, something. So you can, you can definitely figure that out. And if not, I think um, Decode is, it's so great. I, I feel like I haven't had to explain Decode at all. Everyone on the panel is just like, oh yeah, Decode. But Decode, we're a technology accelerator aimed at accelerating um, emerging tech companies into the federal market. And we are always happy to sort of just help anyone better understand how they can get their foot in, foot in the door into one of those agencies. So you are welcome to reach out. Um, I do want to turn it over. We have so many questions. So I'm going to just start diving into the chat and again, Feel, everyone feel free to drop in your questions and I hope we get to all of them. Um, and Joy, thank you for jumping in and I know you're already answering the question. So I will try not to be redundant here, but um, he, here's a great one. I'm gonna scroll way back up. Recommendations on gaining a contract when you don't have a record of working with the government yet. Probably network and try to get on as a sub first and that's my recommendation it's tough to just go to an agency unless you know a contracting officer or you can meet with the small business uh, office there and see if they can help you and do you have any discriminators that might be uh, important to a contracting officer I think, I think when um, there's procurements for actual solutions you know technology products um, I think they're a lot less lenient or a lot more lenient I should say uh, where commercial past performance is fine. It doesn't have to be just government. Great. Primarily yeah, I'll, that. I'll go back to the, you know, what I've said earlier, which is like, if you're earlier stage with no past performance whatsoever, obviously subbing is, you know, something, but even that, you know, has its challenges and as, as Naveen and Larry have pointed out, and then, and then even trying to get your foot in the door, so there's a, there's a lot of programs. I think in the last two years, we started this company three years ago. In the last two years, we've seen so much acceleration of innovation. You mentioned Naval X. Special Ops Command has their own program. Air Force has AFWorks. Army has Army Applications Lab. Um, so really going and finding out as much as you can about those and then, and then figuring out a, game, a strategy around who you, who you talk to and, and what you pursue. And the networking naturally organically happens if you do that because you're going to meet a lot of people. You're going to end up at these different things like Defense Entrepreneurs Forum. Um, you know, there's a number of these happy hours and things happening. And I would agree, uh, you know, if you can, uh, you can do what Naveen says, just kind of be disciplined about attending one or two or meeting with some people every week, you're, you're gonna see an acceleration in whatever you're trying to accomplish. And on that, so uh, we have a question about SBIR funds and, um, particularly about whether or not they've, they've been reducing over, t over the last couple of years. So I guess, one, have you seen a reduction in SBIR funds? Um, and two, I, assuming it might be useful to understand other alternatives to SBIR um, that founders can take a look at. Um, I'll start. No, there's not been a reduction. There's actually been acceleration. Uh, now, if we use DOD specifically as an example, they're all trying to still figure their stuff out. They're not, they're not, this is, they're new to this innovation game, quite frankly, and they're trying to play catch up. Uh, they realize that other countries, uh, I'll just say China are way ahead of us in AI and er Southern er areas, and they're trying to really tap into the innovation that our country offers. So what the Air Force, as an example, is doing, they have a program called AFWorks, and they are playing the VC game where they're spreading a little money to a whole lot of companies. And the ones that stand out um, and you know, really have something can try to go apply for phase twos and then there's a path to phase three as well. Um, and even if you never get to phase three, hopefully you get down a path to start doing some of the other things we've talked about on this call um, in terms of you know, just finding out how acquisition happens. But I would say the answer is no, there's actually a lot more money. You just, again, each, each branch is just different. DHS has their own SIBRs. Navy has their own for, for way of doing it. Army 
you know, so I'd say if I had to, you know, be very honest here and tell you who's ahead, I'd say the Air Force is way ahead right now with uh, their secretary, Will Roper, who's, who's really embraced innovation. Navy and Army are still trying to figure their stuff out. And I think they will because they're, they're really, yeah, they are starting these programs. So, you know, it's exciting to see it happen. So I think if you're an early stage company and you have some technology or service that you're trying to offer, uh, stay in touch with all of these programs and just see how they grow because Navy and, and Army are also growing and even Air Force is figuring it out. So, and each cycle is different by the way too. Um, there's this three or four cycles a year, typically three, and each cycle is a little bit different. So there could be a temporary reduction, but overall the trend is increasing. I'm going to say um, a lot of it has to do with research. Um, you know, Larry said, follow the money. Uh, you know, we're right now doing account planning as we head into the new fiscal year. So, you know, there's so much publicly available information around congressional budgets, uh, breaking it down by agency, how much is in IT, um, how much is going towards AI, what are the programs that are being funded, is it a contract grant or SBIR, OTA. Um, so if, if, you, if you can take that extra step to do that research, um, and there's so much publicly, 10, 15 years ago, there was nothing. You know, now everything is available online and it could just really shortcut um, your focus on your sales activity. And then, and Joy, did you have anything to add? Um, I'll leave it into the next question. I'm sure it'll, it'll, it'll compliment. So yeah, Kate, go right ahead. Great. Well, the next question, um, which is actually super interesting, how should I begin to develop a new relationship for education, training, and consulting with the federal agencies um, as an LLC that targets helping to move the marginalized community to the workforce via a STEM-related, culturally appropriate training context? My brain's thinking. Hang on, um, one, one second, Larry. Are you also trying to find a way to weave it, weave it in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing that came to mind is that STEM priority, STEM talent in our country, there is a huge need for that, and the Department of Defense, in particular, um, same with some of the other intel agencies, do prioritize um, attracting fresh talent. Right? We'll say fresh talent, not necessarily young blood, but. Um, just a new way of thinking. And in particular, there are set asides to fund STEM related research and courses. You see it even at the service level with the Air Force. Uh, they have an initiative called Digital U to turn every airman into a coder, essentially, as well, and at least be a little bit dangerous there. So um, if you're trying to build that the type of organization you're describing, um, I would pay attention to what's your distribution between services and products. What does that look like? Is the end goal to have a um, SAS related platform for, for training STEM talent. Um, the other way to do it would be to build a services company where you're actually cutting partnerships with local universities. There's something called um, a University Applied Research Center or a UARC. Um, so Virginia Tech is one of those. That's an example locally here. Um, engaging there and then figuring out what the hook is into the government customer um, is probably a good place to start. Great, um, and move on to, oh, I will also note because another aspect facet of Decode, we are actually running government trainings for, what well, we are running trainings for government. And so one thing to note is if you are looking to sell a, a service as particularly training to government, there's a whole training budget tied to each agency. And that money is sort of, sort of set aside from uh, funding that you might be looking for if you are selling a product or a technology or maybe a service related to that product. And so I'd recommend you really diving into who holds the budget for training um, and where that is, because it's a little bit different than if you were just sort of looking at, uh, at big IT spend or the big budget overall. There's a sort of breakdown, particularly for training and education. Um, and a couple questions here, I'm just going to lump them together for sake of time, and I think they all hit on something similar around set-asides and 8A. And Larry, I know Meridian is an 8A, and I'm sure um, everyone on this panel has had experience with 8As and, and set-asides, small business set-asides. So just um, a couple questions around what a set-aside is and what an 8A is. And so would love for Larry in particular, if you wouldn't mind just answering um, 
what an 8A business is or a small business set aside is, and then um, a question around uh, applying for for a set aside and how long that takes. Um, so whoever is open to answering that, also throw that out there. Well, there's a bunch of discriminators out there, you know, Alaska Native, uh, you know, minority, women owned. There's a bunch of different discriminators. You have to apply. Some of these you have to apply. Some are self-certification, the, the big ones. Like 8A, you have to apply. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, there are super 8As now, Alaska Native, uh, uh, Indian Reservation, uh, those type of uh, American Indian. Are, so they have, uh, they have no uh, ceilings that contracts they can get. One comment that somebody made in there, I'll tell you, be careful when you bid, uh, especially like if you, some, if you have an 8A, you gotta be that before you bid. But some JVs, uh, if you put together an 8A JV, you don't actually have to have that together until the award. But what we just saw a contract where an award was made to an 8A JV, and they didn't get it approved in time and lost a lost a 35 million dollar award. So make sure you have your ducks in order. So you know, I, I like this. I like this question. We are 8A, and it's a strategic decision. Um, but you, you know, to me you kind of have to figure out how to stack the deck with acquisition filters. The government is trying to find a way for limited competition. That could be a set aside. It could be a facility clearance. It could be an audited accounting system. It could be your line of credit. It could be a contract vehicle. There's so many that create a limited competition and gives you a higher chance to win opportunities. Um, you know, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt, just like people said to prime he uses set aside to grow into a mid-tier business. And so, you, you know, you're kind of constantly transforming your company in order to go through those maturity models. Um, 8A is um, a lot more streamlined now. Um, it is online. Um, for those that are worried about the qualifications around net worth and salary, they just changed those rules about roughly, I think about 50 days ago, it increased them pretty drastically. So. Uh, but in our first two years, we got, I think, nearly nine 80 school sources up to $4 million. Um, and so it's just a, a great way to, like, really get out of the gate, lean and expand, expand build your experience, um, and just, just a quick path because you're able to do the direct awards. And so, you know, it's just a much easier way than the competitive landscape. And I could talk about this subject for an hour, so... Better cut me off. <laughs> You're one of the few, Naveen. One of the few. Um, <laughs> speaking of another topic that people love to talk about, ITAR. <laughs> what are the ITAR considerations with government contracts with small businesses? I don't have a whole lot of experience with ITAR. I do know that. Uh, Certain contracts that we 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 won, we had to become, we had to go through the uh, application process of getting ITAR certified, and there's a cost to it. Uh, and uh, and every year, if you're not careful, uh, if you don't renew it, you'll lose it, and you have to start the process again, which is time consuming. So that's probably my limited knowledge. Yeah, I'm, I'm throwing the general um, definition in the chat um, because people hear the word ITAR compliance, but don't really know what that means. Um, and what it means in, you know, at the highest level is in the chat here. So it's a, it's a regulation to understand where arms are, are being sold to and coming from. So a good example is the Joint Strike Fighter Program, um, you know, Next Generation Fighter Jet. Uh, we, the United States, sell that to other countries. Um, and there's both a risk in selling it to partners and an advantage when you're doing coalition forces. That's a big, large, large, large procurement of an example of ITAR regulations. It also hits software. Um, and it also does hit, uh, so those of you that have heard the um, Trusted Capital Marketplace Initiative, this idea of clean capital, meaning no undue influence from, from other countries influencing the startup community. So there's all these kind of sub tiers to ITAR compliance, but the short answer is yes, it can affect small businesses in particular, if you're going after 
um, a contract and that's the last box to check and all of a sudden your programmers are offshore and now that's not within compliance and you don't win. So that's a, that's a relatively straightforward example, hopefully. Yeah, and to what Joy said, right, it really depends on the service or product you're providing to government and the context in which you are providing it. So I'd highly recommend taking a look at ITAR, like when you actually need to be compliant to ITAR standards and when it applies to your product. Um, and there actually is an office in DHS whose job it is, is to educate companies on ITAR compliance and exports regulations. So I would highly recommend checking, checking them out. I will um, try and see if I can find a link and share that with the DC startup group team later on. But um, it is their whole job is just to provide this support for free to companies. So you don't have to spend a ridiculous number of hours and resources to pay for a lawyer to review for you. And just diving in additional questions. Uh, and, and another bit of a switch suggestions on government partnerships slash contracts to pursue for mental health startups or even like health startups in general because they know it's a little bit of a different path. Yeah, I think um, one place to look is um, in anything with a personnel and readiness mission. Um, they have mental health is 100% a part of their core competency, um, not just for service members, but also their families, right, when they deploy. Um, so I think that that's a good place to start in any, um, you can do your own Googling basically to, to do some contract research and instead of going the cyber route, actually go the prime contractor route. So. What I would do is go down a research hole to understand who's already in that space, who would your competitors be, what competitors are larger than you. Um, and then once you go to their site, if they are already selling to government, a lot of times large primes will publish, here's our customers, here's the contract vehicles, and you can start thinking, okay, well, does my product actually have value to their army customer. If it does, the prime is going to look at you and say, I can make money on your thing. And that's a good foothold, right? You have to be prepared as we already discussed. They're going to take a markup. It's going to be tough, but at least it gets you in the door. And then from there you can um, land and expand. But I would definitely say um, personnel and readiness, anything with a readiness mission, that's really your keyword on mental health and stability of forces. Yeah, and HHS is another one. Um, there's definitely specific programs within Department of Health and Human Services and specific programs, specific sub-agencies that you can look to target um, with some research. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And I'm going to, just for the everyone in the chat, I'm going to answer two final questions. And then for the sake of time, we'll just uh, close out and wrap up. But definitely... Um, I'm sure D DC startup team and Corey in particular can go over next steps on how you can continue to engage with us after this. So um, the two final questions uh, and both great ones. First, depending on what agency you want to work with, they might require you, might they require you to have secure servers when handling government sensitive information? Any companies that provide pre-built cloud-based Fed compliant servers? Um, one, one of the things that people do have is SCIFs uh, where you're able to do work um, with the three-letter agency, for example, where you're working on developing classified products or material or handling. Um, and th that could, th these are actually shared SCIFs where, where your personnel sits or you can work or even receive opportunities. Um, it, it's, it, it is a good way especially like if you're starting out to do it, uh, but procurements are, you know, by in part, very specific by agency and in the description of what they're looking for on the restrictions of what you have to have as a company um, in order to be able to perform the work. Yeah, I think the, the other thing, um, there, there's one recommendation on a good partner I have and then one regulatory thing to be aware of. Um, something called FedRAMP. Uh, I, it's like everybody's worst nightmare. It, it is expensive, but all that means is that you are approved to handle and store government data. And depending on um, who your end client or customer would be, they might want you to not touch the data and totally firewall it off. They might want you to build on a classified system or something in between. 
Um, and everybody's moving to a FedRAMP authorized environment in secure gov cloud. So even if you're an on-prem provider and you're still at leveraging government data from the cloud, you still have to be compliant. So um, there's organizations that can help you become compliant if you want to make the investment, if you're capitalized and you've got funding, um, it can be anywhere between a half a million to a million, but worth it. Um, if you don't want to go that route and trying to save time and money, uh, a great partner company that we've used before is a company called Appian, A-P-P-I-A-N, and they are um, one of the best when it comes to secure cloud. They're already approved and you basically just sub to them. Um, great development company. Great advice. And the final question we'll be able to get to, uh, what, do you see, what do you see for the future uh, for machine learning and AI contract opportunities in federal? Um, I'll start, there, there's a ton. I think Naveen probably has a lot more specifics, but I'm seeing a lot of opportunities. And that's a very broad subject across many different domains, almost every domain. So, I mean, the, the, the answer is the trend is just going up. But Naveen, go ahead. I know you want, you're ready to say something there. No, no, I mean, I mean, those two and RPA, RPA is my favorite. I mean, it's just, RPA is great because you're able to show a tangible ROI by implementing RPA within so many different departments, processes, uh, domain areas. Uh, the government right now is in love with this um, funding. Uh, the CIOs, they wanna make the splash. They wanna get the pilots. They're, everybody's getting the directive to implement the pirates, pilots, definitely not pirates. And then they're creating BPAs. It's, you know, like, you know, blanket purchase agreements that are multiple award, encouraging young companies. And they're just saying, how can I continue to do it? Uh, me and Promote work at National Science Foundation. Uh, that's a great one where, you know, they're establishing, I think, $100, $100 million plus uh, AI grant, grant right now. So, um, almost every agency, this is such a prolific area to be involved. Yeah, I agree. It's really the new cyber. That's how I look at it. Where cyber was five years ago or even a little longer, it's, it's what, it, what has replaced it. Yeah, there's a big opportunity in um, upgrades to legacy systems. So systems that didn't um, used to leverage uh, the deep capabilities of AI and ML. A good example is predictive maintenance because um, maintenance costs, if you are predicting it, are big, big, big drag on the bottom line. Um, so I think there's definitely opportunities there. If I can, just a couple parting thoughts and then and then I'll shut up over here. If I if if you guys take anything away from entering the government market, um. Couple, couple of words of advice. Uh, be psychologically prepared because it's definitely twice as long and twice as difficult. Somebody told me that and I was coming from government and, and I, I was like, what are you talking about? And then we did it, right? So, so just be psychologically prepared. And what I mean by that is you really have to go through the journey. And step one, um, this is where you put up your pens or keyboards. Step one is to figure out how to create value, right? And not just uh, I want to build this thing because I want to build it. Like really understand what pain point you're solving for an operator or a government user. So one is to create value. Um, two, Larry, you hit on this in the beginning. You have to build a model that works, right? A financial model of what your thing is, where you're taking it, how you sell it, how you distribute it. Um, so that that whole cycle. Um, and then we, we talked about the third, third, and third SGNA COGS and profit. And then finally. Um, Way back to the top of the hour, you have to engage persistently. So you have to go out of your way to create relationships, to continue to offer value in those conversations, not just take take away from it. So um, if you're going to do it, create value, build a financial model that works, and then engage persistently with the market and you'll be successful. And just to add to that, just make, make sure what you're selling to them is valuable. I mean, we, we developed a cyber product that we actually did because we were on a contract and we figured out what the requirement they needed and we filled it by building one. And then we realized soon after it was better selling it and faster selling in the commercial world. And that's where we did it. So, you know, you just have to figure out uh, what works best and uh, continually look at your, your, your solution and, or, your, or your services and find out what the best customer is. But you've got to bring value. If you don't bring any value, you're going to be useless. And on that note, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Larry and Naveen from Oath and Joy for taking out your time out of your day and providing such valuable guidance and advice to these founders. I can't believe this was free, honestly. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Corey just to close us out. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, uh, Joy, Larry, Naveen, Premrod, and Bria for bringing your perspectives to this fantastic discussion on growth through government agency partnerships and contracts. We really appreciate your time and support of the DC Startup Week community today. Um, next up, we've got five o'clock, Venture Capital, The Journey to VC Funding. At six o'clock, we've got Disability Startup Pitch Competition. And seven o'clock, we have a Creative Economy Party. So um, go back into Attendify. Feel free to reach out to any of the speakers there. Um, you can direct message them within the platform. Put any insights that you learn into the activity feed. And I will see you guys at our next events. Thank you.